Welcome to Trading Strategies for September. We are focusing on what's hot. It's as simple as that. And even though it seems like everything is hot with stocks back at record highs, that's exactly when you need a few pros to bring some reason into your investing strategy. We have you covered over the next hour with an all-star panel. Let's welcome back Stephen Sarge Guilfoyle, a markets expert and former NYSE trader. David Yo Williams is a commodities and gold expert. He's also a principal at Strategic Gold. And Peter Schur is a fixed income expert and managing director of Breen Capital. He's also heading up the street's new fixed income product, Income Seeker. And Douglas Borthwick is the head of foreign exchange at Chapter Lane. So guys, it's great to see you back here. I, I want to start off with the fact that September is historically the worst month of the year for the stock market, with the S&P 500 losing an average of 0.7% every year since 1945 during the month. Yet here we are two weeks into the month and stocks are at record highs. What's going on here? Sarge, let's start with you. Well, that, that history has something to do with the government's fiscal year, really. And uh, as we just saw with the president reaching across the aisle, that's kind of been pushed out a little bit. Not the budget, but the, uh, but the debt limit. So. I think that's one of the positives. We have many positives right now. That's why we're trading at all-time highs as far as equities go. But the president actually making peace with some Democrats and, embarrass now. and embarrassing some Republicans that, quite frankly, deserved it. Mm. I, I think he's put one more feather in our cap. All right. David, do you agree with that? Uh, no. <laughs> Shockingly, uh, I would say uh, I reach back to there, there's an old movie about boxing. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Mm. And uh, we're up at these lofty levels. And God bless it. And be, I would be very, very careful. So are you levels. calling a top here? In the I, I, I think this fall, uh, sometime this fall, I mean, I don't know about September, but I, I think certainly um, before the winter months come, before December comes, I think we're going to um, see a significant uh, decline. But the, the question, though, is what is significant? Because significant in this low volatility environment has been a one percent sell-off. You know, it's been nineteen. I don't think that. No, it's no, been no. nineteen months since the S and P five hundred sold off ten percent. One percent is not significant. Ten percent is barely significant. I wow. think you have to go fifteen, twenty percent. Really? Yes, to be significant. Peter, weigh in here. I think we're at an inflection point in the market where we are either going to get a large move down, called the order of 10%, or we could see a very large move up. And I think it's going to play that out a bit. That doesn't help us. <laughs> well, I think you're not going to see a small move. I actually think this whole summer where we've treaded along, where, you know, the S&P 500 was at 2480 back in August. So yeah, we're at new highs, but it's only been a 15 point move. I think we could see a real significant 5 to 10% move to the upside or downside probably in the next month or two as we see whether Trump is successful in this and gets things in place or if it falls apart. I think that's going to be the telling point, and the move is going to be very large, and we're going to stop this kind of low vol market. Douglas, what do you make of the record highs so far this month? Well, I think the record highs come as a result of the weakness in the dollar. I think dollar is the basis for everything. Mm. But as the dollar weakens by 1%, the S&P earnings go up by half a percent. Okay. So as long as you see a weakening dollar, I think you continue to see the stock market go up. Now, Perhaps that's why the Russell has been rebounding lately. Yeah, I would expect so. But, but not only that, if you look at you know, tensions globally, they seem to have come back somewhat. And so people are feeling a little bit more confident in the market right now. North Korea, imminent nuke strike, doesn't seem like it's happening tomorrow. Mm. And so people are a little bit more relaxed about that. The hurricanes passed as well. People are thinking, well, there'll be some rebuilding efforts that may be positive for the economy. And I think that these things will sort of have the stock market take a pause right now that, that refreshes. But I think that if you see the dollar continue its weakness, which I believe, you'll see the stock market continue to move up gradually. Can, can we just zoom out for a moment? I mean, Sarge, what gets the Dow to 30,000? We're at 22 right now. Oh, geez. Tax reform, man. I mean, you, if you give us satisfactory tax reform on top of a, an ECB that needs to tighten monetary policy, you're going to see earnings expansion that's already in place expand that much more. I don't know if we go to 30,000 on the Dow. That's a heck of a long way. But I'll tell you what, we'll get Peter's 5 to 8% move to the upside. Mm -hmm. I certainly see that happening. Okay, David, obviously, forget Dow 30,000. You might be thinking, you know, Dow 15,000. Uh, I, I, tax reform is interesting. Tax reform is, is um, I think it's necessary. I think it, it'll help. But I, I think it's, I think we're, we're past that, those points. I think, I think we've spent um, the last eight years globally uh, spending money, uh, inflating um, uh, asset prices, and specifically uh, stock prices, and I think that that that's that train is 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 
is finished. It's, we're at the stage where it's unloading. It's, I don't think it can go on much further. You think with hurricanes we're not going to spend more? With, I think, with, with I North think, Korea we're not going to spend more? I think we're going to continue to spend, but at a certain point uh, it doesn't work. So, so we what have that, just... What does that mean, it doesn't work? There, there's never in the history of humanity been a uh, nation that's been able to print money indefinitely create wealth out of nothing just by printing. At some point in time it stops. And so if we just, if we just went through uh, the debt ceiling uh, negotiations in the blink of an eye mm -hmm. with uh, President Trump reaching over the aisle and shaking hands with three senators and saying, okay, let's raise the debt ceiling in, uh, in uh, conjunction with yeah. hurricane relief and, and Harvey relief, uh, you can't just spend what you don't have. Well, that's, that's why this debt ceiling drama went away for September because of the storm, right? It wasn't Correct. just because people magically came together. There was an urgent need to get this thing done. Sarge, I want to talk about the hurricane. I mean, have you been making any trades uh, to benefit? Obviously, we've seen the reinsurer stocks move higher. Oh, sure. Road building stocks. What is your advice for people trying to play these storms? I think you can still get into these names. I've been buying Owens Corning. Hmm. Uh, Wirehauser, people need timber, they need roofing material, they need insulation. Uh, I bought Valero ahead of the storms. Hmm. Uh, I just got lucky there. I mean, I know all the refiners are looking pretty good right now, but Valero actually happened to be the one that came through with, oh, I think, the least amount of damage when, uh, when Hurricane Harvey hit Texas, which is kind of like bubblegum shrimp boat hmm. success, just uh, sailing through, fortunately, through the storm. I, uh, these three stocks have performed very well. There are many others. Honeywell's set up nicely. Uh, Utex will probably do nicely now, and it's depressed, so you can actually buy Utex mm -hmm. probably at a decent price. I think it's trading around 110 last I looked. It's, it's off of a high around 120, so that's a name that you could get involved in. Uh, Beacon Roofing. There's, there's, there's a number of stocks that... Uh, and it's not too late. It's, well, look at the individual stocks, but I think it's not too late because these people, well, many of these people probably haven't even ordered these materials yet. Sure. They, they, there's going to be months and months. I mean, I'm from Long Island. Hurricane Sandy, there are still people rebuilding. Yeah, that was five years ago. You know, I had Liz Ann Sanders on this morning from Charles Schwab, and she dug up some interesting research actually showing that the market reaction after a major hurricane is actually good. I mean, you look back to uh, Hurricane Wilma in 2005. We had a 7% rise in the S&P 500 about nine months after that storm. Hurricane Sandy, like you mentioned, nine months later, we had a 25% rise in the S&P. It's S &P. the spending. It, it, all, it all boils down to spending. It's forced spending, either by the government, by the insurance companies, by the people themselves. Uh, how many cars do they need to buy in Texas now? The auto industry has been, been going the wrong way, right? It's, mm. Sales have been contracting. Well, guess what? This is probably going to be good for the auto companies and for a name like Sirius Radio, which I often recommend and own wow, myself. Interesting. David, what do you make of the impact on the market from this storm? I mean, how would you uh, advise people to be playing this? I would, I would once again, I would advise uh, extreme caution because what what you're describing is 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 obviously historically correct that, that in the past these storms happened we have not been at the stage now though where where the debt uh, excesses have been at these levels and and that's corporate personal and governmental so when you start spending money that you don't have or that you uh, <laughs> Or that you are going to have a difficult time finding, even it's it's a it's a different scenario. So I'm not sure everybody in Texas can go out and buy a new car just because their car got because the insurance companies are going to give it to them, or or because you know they they have the funds available. I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, Peter, in the midst of all this storm, Irma, Harvey, uh, we had a term come back to the mainstream financial media, basically cat catastrophe bonds. Uh, yeah. We haven't heard those about those in a while. Can you explain what they are and sort of how people should be watching them? Yeah, I think that's actually a really important thing to look at. We actually are putting out a note on Income Seeker about actually this is a good time to invest in them. So catastrophe bonds or cat bonds for short basically are diversified exposures to insurance risk. Mm -hmm. So it tends to be across different states, across different types of insurance products, and you tend to get a senior slice. So the reinsurers or the insurance companies are taking the first loss and they've created these bonds as a way to fund themselves. It, the market had been very, very big. It shrunk, I think it's around 30 to 40 billion right now, so it's a little bit less than 50 billion, which is one reason I spoke to both uh, State Street and BlackRock. Neither have launched ETFs on this because mm. the market's probably a bit too small to be an ETF, so you have to find an asset manager. But what I like about this market right now is you saw bonds come down. I think CS has a good index of bonds. It probably went down from average price around par to, I believe, low 70s. It's back to mid 80s. I think this is actually a unique time to buy these cat bonds. Hmm. It looks like, you know, I hate to say the word, but they weathered the storm right. fairly well. The damage wasn't as bad. The structural seniority of these bonds is coming to pass. So you get these bonds relatively cheap right now. 
The other thing that does tend to happen is when you go through storms like this, reinsurance rates go up, so the cost of insurance goes up. So going forward for the next two to three years, the protection on these bonds should even be better. So I would move in now. I think you have to find an asset manager. I would not recommend buying these bonds directly, but I think it's a neat little part of the market, great for income, nice yields. I think these bonds will continue to bounce and so you'll get some nice upside return as well as the income. But help us Do out here. Do most asset managers have an understanding of this? No, I think you have to go to a specialized asset manager. There's some people who are very well known, you can look for them. Mm -hmm. They tend to offer it through mutual fund or hedge fund type um, allocations. At the same time, I have talked to several large institutional investors who had been in the market, pulled back, and are looking at how the market's behaving right now. So I think you could see some new institutional money come in, which would drive spreads to new tights. So, so let's say 20% of your portfolio is in fixed income. Of that 20%, how, what percent should be in cap bonds? I mean, is there, is there a threshold? I, mean, I would think that 5% would be a pretty heavy weighting. If you maybe right now with where the prices are, you go up to 10% with a goal of moving back to 5%. Of that, 20%. So, you know, not recommending 5% of your entire portfolio, more like 1%. Okay. Well, you know, before we go any further, let's take a look at where we stand in stocks so far this year. Uh, the Dow is up 12%. The S&P 500 is up 11.5%. The Russell 2000 is higher by 5%. Now, this is important. We're going to talk about this later. And the tech-heavy NASDAQ is up 20%. And this brings us to our next subject. Guys, no surprise that the NASDAQ has sort of beaten all these indexes here. But with that, obviously, becomes some, some worry if people are wondering if we've gotten a little bit too ahead of ourselves in the tech sector. Sarge, update us on your view of tech stocks. I'm not selling them. I'm not selling my tech names. Uh, I'm still long NVIDIA. I'm still long Lam Research. Intel, these are still my favorite names. Uh, Activision Blizzard in the gaming space. Uh, I don't expect to get out of those names anytime soon. I'm not sure if Seagate Technology has bottomed, but at least you'll get a nice yield there. I think they're paying 8% now. That is a company that has consistently performed poorly, but consistently preserved their dividend, which is a different way to look at tech. Uh, then again, I'm, I'm almost exclusively focusing on the, focusing on the semiconductors, which, right. which is my favorite space within tech. Can, can we talk about the, the Apple event from yesterday? This, this is a stock that's up 37% so far this year. Sarge, you're long Apple. I mean, you watched the event yesterday. I mean, how did it, how did it change your view of, this, of the stock? Did it make you more excited about it? I'm longer Apple right now than I was this morning. Hmm. If that, that if answers that's an my answer question, for you. yeah. Uh, I like the dip. I, I don't know if, I think it, it's almost like clockwork that you can predict this dip from Apple on the day of and in the day after when they present. Uh, it, I think people are largely disappointed, but I think with this $1,000 phone that mm -hmm. they're throwing at people, mm -hmm. it's not so much a $1,000 phone that they're trying to sell you, they're trying to steer you. They're trying to steer you into the Apple Watch because mm -hmm. the Apple Watch is going to be considerably cheaper and the phone right now is 55% of their revenue, which is no way for a firm to survive. If they can get the lower and middle class American consumer to buy the Apple Watch, that opens up a whole new door for them. So that's what they're trying to well, do. Well, aren't they also trying to, by with this iPhone X having augmented reality features, they're trying to get people into that, that gaming ecosystem to boost up that right. services. That's the high revenue. end. That's the people that can afford to spend $1,000 on a phone and can afford to buy the apps that these gaming, uh, augmented reality, whatever you want to call it. This, where that end of the business goes, these are the high-end consumers. But by, by focusing on selling these people the watch, which is no longer going to be tethered to a phone, they're going to be able to broaden their customer base. David, what do you think about the Apple event? I mean, are people going to buy this $1,000 phone? I th eventually, I think they will. The, the answer, is, I think, is yes. However, I think to a, to a little larger point, um, what's, what Steve's describing is, is what's happening with Apple you know, over the last several years, five to ten years, is every time they have these these uh, events that come out, they dip a little bit and then they move on. And Apple is a great, is a, been a fantastic stock. That goes to a larger point that that I think I'm, I'm trying to get here is, is complacency, and and a, and a word Doug loves is hubris. Mm -hmm. there, there's you have complacency in the marketplace and you have hubris and and complacency in in the case of Apple. What, what Stephen just described was, okay, you have dips on, on Apple today after an event that happened yesterday, and then we think that once uh, a quarter goes by, they're gonna start, you're going to start receiving sales, and the stock is going to go up, and it's going to be great, so buy the dip and, and keep on going. That, that's worked well for a, a considerable amount of time. Wonderful. But complacency, there's, there, there are new realities out there, and, and, and you, ha you have to be very, very you know, cognizant of complacency and hubris. If, you get, if you're so uh, enamored with your own uh, abilities to 
uh, say, oh, the markets are going to go up no matter what, then, you know, or the, the Fed is great, or the government's going to happen, you know, Trump's doing a great job, or Trump's not doing a great job, it doesn't matter. That kind of, that kind of attitude leads to um, what I've been describing in, that I think is going to happen um, this fall, is where you're going, to get a, you're going to get a significant correction, because hubris and complacency are always met with um, reality. Yeah, guys, what, to the, the point Dave is making about hubris, weigh in on that. I think, again, we have this degree of complacency in the market. I think the tech sector is actually seeing a lot of that. I disagree a little bit with um, Steve here in terms of w the risk to the NVIDIAs of the world. To some degree, you can look at, you can track Bitcoin, has been a huge boost to the tech and semiconductor area. That's all of a sudden sliding. You're seeing some pressure globally on Bitcoin. It's, you know, I'm sure it's no coincidence that Jamie Dimon came out bashing on it yesterday. So there seems to be a global effort to suppress something like a Bitcoin, and that's been a big driver for a lot of tech companies. Yeah, yeah what did mining. you make of Jamie Dimon's comments saying that Bitcoin is, is a fraud? I mean, that was a pretty stark comment there. It was a very aggressive comment. I think Doug had some good thoughts on that. Yeah, Doug, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's an aggressive comment. I think that it's it's what a lot of folks feel if they missed missed the boat. And uh, you know, when you add into that, he talked about how his daughter had bought some, and then you know she, she thought she was a genius, a genius right? Well, you know, I, I, I have family members that are in that way too, and I look at them and I'm so I have a biased opinion where I think oh, there's no way this could be that easy. Now at the same time, I think that Bitcoin is in trouble. Mm -hmm. I think that you know China came out earlier in the week after getting pressured by the U.S. to put sanctions on North Korea. Mm. China came out and said, you know what, we're going to put uh, some, some controls over the, uh, how Bitcoin is traded in our country. Mm. And I think that that's because North Korea is very involved in Bitcoin as well. And I think that Jamie Dimon may have glossed over that when he talked about North Korea and Venezuela, I believe, mm -hmm. in yesterday's conversation. But certainly I believe that if it is seen as being something that's used by government players to wash money, launder money, get it in and out of the country, then it's something that will be shut down by governments. And I think that China may have been pressured by the U.S. to do this in their country because North Korean actors were, were using it. I think the U.S. could move in that direction too because, look, the government likes to see someone's buying something, someone's selling something, and, and taking the tax from it. Here's a product where they're not seeing all the information. And I think that that, for them, isn't in their interest for it to continue. But Jamie Dimon also said that Bitcoin could go to 100,000 before it starts to go down. So there's clearly... A trade here. I mean, do you got what? What would you tell people about Bitcoin if they're they're dying to get in now? I would if they're if they're dying to get in now. Um, just like I advise my good friend Stephen on on equities, go ahead. Um, it doesn't mean they're not going to go. Out. I'm just because I'm predicting that something you know might you know there there might be some sort of a a, a, a dip here or a, or a more significant doesn't mean it can't go up because it can, obviously it can. So if you're trading and you're actively trading something like Bitcoin. God bless you. You know, I mean, obviously, like Doug says, there's a lot of people who made a lot of money in this. Um, so good for them. But you do have to be absolutely aware of what's behind it and what's what what could happen and what are the possibilities, so that you either exit or you get buried with it. If you know, it, it, it you know, depending on what your entry point is. Yeah. Well, Bitcoin is up what 300 percent so far this right. year. Sarge, you mentioned Nvidia earlier. Obviously, that's one of your holdings. Bitcoin is certainly the cryptocurrencies. Part of NVIDIA, but obviously NVIDIA is a much right. bigger animal. That's why you've seen NVIDIA and AMD underperform the last couple of days a little bit, which is fine. I mean, NVIDIA can come in a long way and I'd still be all right with them. They're still in every pertinent technology business there is. So I, I think I'm not really worried about NVIDIA. If it comes in, I'll simply buy more. Bitcoin, I kind of agree with Jamie Dimon. I, mm. I think it's, it's largely gambling. It's not trading. Uh, I think almost 80% of Bitcoin trading actually takes place in China, right? So for China to crack down is a big deal. And, and I think you can expect other governments and, and central banks to also try to crack down mm. on, on Bitcoin or on cryptocurrency in general. I, I don't think they're going to tolerate for long the competition. I believe the Bitcoin price is now, what, 4000 something, something around like that? It was there. Oh, it's just below, below there. there. So yeah. does anyone want to make a prediction as to where it goes by the end of the year? Look, how do you value something right. when it's really based on supply, demand, and marketing factors? Mm. So if I had a Rothko painting and the media <laughs> talked about it every single day, my guess is it would go up in value. Mm. And I think that if <laughs> you have something here that, that's very well marketed, that you, everyone has friends around that, that say they've made a little bit of money in it, and so folks jump into it as well. But I still don't see how you can value it. And if you can't value something, then in my mind, it's not something I want to be involved in. Um, Peter, you, you mentioned the, the tech sector earlier, just how, how much hubris there is throughout that sector. Um, 
I do want to also talk about some of the small cap stocks because the Russell 2000 really hasn't participated as much as other sectors have in this rally this year. It's up about 5% so far this year. Uh, Doug, you were also alluding to small cap stocks earlier. Give us your outlook on small cap for the rest of the year. Well, I think that small cap doesn't benefit necessarily as much as multinationals do, which, which are the larger cap stocks. And so my view would be that, that small caps aren't picking up the headwind that's coming from the weaker dollar. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get that weaker dollar headwind, you've got to go into the larger cap stocks, and that's, you know, the S&P 500 obviously picks up with that, but the, the smaller cap stocks are probably not, they're not involved quite as much internationally, mm -hmm. and so don't get that headwind that you get with the weaker dollar. Peter, what do you think? I think it's the tax reform that's really going to be driving small cap. We need tax reform, and we need some deregulation, and that goes directly to help the small cap companies, right? They tend to pay much higher ta average tax rates. You know, the big companies have all figured out ways to reduce their nominal tax rate. They, the smaller companies have not. So I think that's going to be the big driver. That's why we saw them do so well at the start of the Trump era. And they kind of faded as we lost that path. If we see this progression, I think small stocks will do very, very well. One of the things I continue to look at is the high yield bond market. Mm -hmm. And I always compare a little bit the high yield bond market to the Russell 2000. Investment grades more S&P 500. The high yield market's a little bit more Russell 2000. That market's been holding in very well. It's still able to get cash. There's a little bit of weakness around the Tesla deal, but that market's doing very well. There's cash available. So if there's anything that kind of spurs growth with small companies, it's very well set up to get the funding from the bonds. So that's where I see the upside. I would much rather be long a little bit of that and short some tech and so, bet on this change going through. So then you maybe don't agree with all these billionaires coming out and saying the bond market's in a bubble. I don't really agree on the bond market being in a bubble. I think the bond market it reflects a couple of things. One, it reflects the fact that central banks globally are keeping short-term interest rates very low. So if you keep one-year money or overnight money at one and a quarter percent, you can only have the 10-year go so high and it's not going to go that high. I think the bond market's a little bit more scared about the state of the economy, about the state of growth. And I think that's going to trickle into banks. So I would definitely avoid the banks here. Okay. Besides from what I think the big money center banks are not going to do well because I think this quarter has been extremely slow in terms of volumes and volatility. But if you look at the shape of the yield curve, the twos, tens, I think is at 85 basis points, which is the lowest it's been, I think, in five years. So that ability for banks to generate money is very low. I think that really hits the small and community banks the most because they do rely on that shape of the yield curve probably more than the money center banks. And that's the lifeblood of the economy. So we need those banks to get the money. I, I want to talk about banks because we've been seeing yields on the 10-year come in over the past couple months. We hit a high for the year of 2.6 on March 13th. Now we're at, what, 2.18? Yeah. Over that same period, the S&P 500 banking sector hasn't really fallen that much, half a percentage point. So uh, is this sort of play that banks are so focused on the yield curve? I mean, is that kind of out the window when you look at some of the numbers that I just mentioned? It's been dwarfed a little bit by all the talk about regulatory reform impacting the banks and the ability to pay dividends again and maybe do stock buybacks. So the banks have benefited, I think, more than certainly the small caps and the hope that some of these simple, simple, painful regulations will get removed. So that's been very supportive. If you look at when the bank stocks have moved, it's been much more along political lines and stories rather than the yield curve so far. Yeah. Well, I think the banks, the banks know how to manage the yield curve, mm -hmm. right? The, everyone knows that the difference between twos right. and tens mm -hmm. is how banks banks trade and so you know, they hedge that out what what they are really concentrating on is are things like MyFed 3 that's coming in in Europe mm -hmm. what they're concentrating on is what's going to happen with the Boca rule that the, when you mentioned MyFed 3 that's about research right that's about research Can and you the explain cost that? of research well it seems that in the old days you would give research for free to your client and right. then the client would do business with you and that would pay for the research in the new world it seems you'll do the trade on an agency basis and you'll charge them for the research. So it's sort of you're separating the cost of research from the cost of doing So business. that's clearly something that, I mean, all these banks have big exposure to Europe, but uh, we don't want a rule like that coming here to the U.S. Well, that would hurt But the here's bank. the thing. Normally when a rule comes in in one place, it starts, okay. starts to right. seep into mm -hmm. the other area too because it's very expensive to have one rule in one country and another in the other. Mm -hmm. If you have a European client and they're looking at U.S. interest rate research and you're charging them over in Europe but you're not in the U.S., then you know, what happens? Right. But clearly, there is there are still major headwinds with the banks, especially when it comes to fixed income currencies and commodities. Sarge, you own shares of Citigroup. They just came out and warned of a 15% decline in trading revenues for this current quarter. J.P. Morgan expects a drop of 20%. I mean, when you hear a forecast like this, what do you say? Well, there you go. And I, that's why I, I'm usually a bank guy, and I haven't been for quite some time. I've largely gotten myself out of the banks. I've remained long Citigroup. I've remained long key bank, although that really hasn't performed for me, and I have cut that position by half. That, that's my favorite large bank. That's my favorite regional bank. 
Outside of that, I've gotten along EUFN, which is an ETF. I don't usually like to go to ETFs, but this is a European financial sector ETF. I do expect Mario Draghi will eventually have to tighten policy. Mm. This is probably going to be a long-term position, and this is where the, the growth in banking probably will be. Well, David, I mean, th the trading space for these banks is so bad that Goldman Sachs is now moving deeper into lending, uh, which obviously and, we haven't seen from them. So what, what does that tell you? I, I think it tells you that, that they are um, seriously looking for some way to um, some path to growth, some path to earnings. Uh, Goldman Sachs came out with their whatever three-year plan or whatever it was, and basically they're, uh, it, it's almost like the, the uh, it's not a Goldman Sachs plan, it's, it's like a classic, you know, cut high-end jobs, add new guys that are cost less, and, and we can just run the business that way and move forward because, because there's such uh, stability, I, I don't want to say complacency in this sense, in the business in the arenas that they're in, that they're, I don't know if there's, there's the ability to make the kind of money that they were making before. And so, and so if you're, depending on, and then once again, you're going to valuation. So depending on the valuations that they're at now with markets at these highs, um, maybe it's not justified. What they're telling you is if they can't make that kind of money going forward, um, and they're making adjustments to their, to their uh, infrastructure in order to make money, then, they, you know, if the profits aren't there, the profits aren't there. Well, yeah. I don't think complacency is, is the right word. I think the banks have had their hands tied by regulations for quite some time. In the old days, in fixed income currencies, commodities, the real profits were made through proprietary positioning. Right. And the client right. flows were sort of in the background. These days, the client flows are everything, and it's about trading on an agency basis. You know, buy 100 and you buy 100 in the market, you pass that price to your client. In the old day, buy 100. Maybe they buy 200. 200, right. And, and, and the right. price would move higher. Regulations have come in, they've, they've changed this, this dynamic, and so now you're looking at a completely different business model. It's not really a large hedge fund that FICC used to be. Now it's, it's, uh, it's an agency. And that's but also it's also because of the VIX. But uh, coming back VIX, to this, yeah. it also has changed. So the new issue component, which was always there, has become a more important component. And so that's every, you know, every day the bond market has two or three IPOs, for lack of a better word, right? There's new issues every single day in the bond market. I think we're already at 60 billion of investment grade this month. And the people who get to do that new issue tend to be the bankers. So if you lend money, you get the right to be involved in the new issue and you get fees from that. That's where Goldman's been lagging. And I think that's why Goldman's stepping up things like wanting to lend so that they can get this new issue business because it's part of this whole changing element of FIC, which is probably here to stay. Even well, if regulations go away we, at this point, I think it's going to be hard for banks to switch back to being more aggressive risk David. takers. We, we've had discussions on this in the past in our summer doldrums where we're talking about um, market infrastructure and how it's changed over the last few years. And what you're, what you're describing, Doug, is, and, and Peter's like, okay, this is a, a, that's, it's a fundamental change in, in the market structure. And so, and so when the time comes to buy and sell bonds or, or stocks or whatever, the market structure isn't there as it used to be. And, once again, that, that's what I'm saying is uh, uh, the level of complacency or hubris now, I, I, I tend to say it shouldn't be because, because today's reality is not what it was even five years ago, much less 10 years ago or, or eight years reality, ago when, the, uh, uh, when uh, we uh, started this run. As Scott just attested, it is, is really VIX related too. Yes. Now, why is the VIX down where it is? It's down where it is because central banks are involved in equities, in fixed income, in currencies, everywhere you look, everywhere except you for look Bitcoin. For <laughs> there's lots of volatility. Right, Where the central okay. banks are, there's none. Now, as the central banks start to move out of their, their policies and QE starts to get unwound and Europe starts to get out of it, then you see volatility come back. How long will that take? Three, four, five years, ten years? So, so then certainly, isn't this an existential problem for the big banks, this yes. low volatility environment? Absolutely, yeah. Without a doubt. So, I mean, Goldman's plan, to me, when I read it, I, I didn't see it as hubris or or any kind of complacency, I saw it as controlled panic. I mean, it's this, this sounded to me like guys who were really nervous about making money. Well, and, and is volatility low largely because everything is just sort of automated? You have these algorithms running no, the markets? No, no. no it's no? because... If equities come off, you see a central bank like the SNB start buying U.S. equities, or you see right. the BOJ buy the U.S. equities. equities. Central, yeah. banks. central banks are in there buying the equities on dips. They buy fixed income on dips. And so there's always someone there, and it's not like the Fed's the last resort anymore. Now they're all the last resort. And this switch to passive, I think, has also reduced volatility. Yes. I think people are more comfortable with longer-term passive positions. Mm -hmm. And I keep talking about homebrew risk parity. Where people, and there's a lot of funds, these 60-40 funds, so they own 60% yeah, equity, 40%. So there's these 60-40 funds, and that's probably the most simplified version, where they own about 60% equities, 40% longer-dated bonds, and it's really, really simplified risk parity, where you hope one moves to offset losses in the other. Those funds have chugged along. They've turned up returns this year around 9 or 10%, so just below the S&P returns with far less volatility even than that. 
So I think that's attractive money, and that's not trading money, right? That's money that tends to be a little bit more sticky. It doesn't react to each move. So I think this is where we've built up this level of complacency that so long as nothing big happens, I think people are very, very comfortable and we can move. If we start getting a big move, particularly at a downside, I think you're going to see a rush for the exit with no real backdrop to you know, support that. So that to me is the risk that we will break out of this low volatility band and it will be very painful. And then you also have all these VIX ETFs, so selling vol has become a strategy. When I look at income products, everyone talks about selling puts as another income strategy. So I think this very low volatility, low yield environment has created a lot of complacent strategies mm -hmm. that have all worked to reduce volatility. And if and when that breaks, it's gonna be very painful. All right, one week from today, we will be just 90 minutes away from a key Fed decision, the Fed September meeting, obviously next Wednesday. Let's just quickly go around and get everyone's take. What do they do with inter interest rates? No hike? No hike, no hike in December. Oh, well, just September, no, no hike? <laughs> nothing, they do nothing. Nothing? They start announcing plans for balance sheet reduction because they want to yes. get that on the table and let people get comfortable with it. It's going to be so small what they announce and what they plan on doing, it's going to come across as a very, very dovish meeting. No hike, but yes on balance sheet triggering. No hike, September, December, balance sheet discussion certainly and a lot of trial balloons. What is it? Trial balloons means they'll option out to the market. Sources say at the Fed, we're thinking about ah. this, we're thinking about this. The market moves around, there's a discussion. And then at the next meeting, they go through all the trial balloons, which one had the best result in the market, and they go with that. So they essentially play with investors as they come Fed speak. Do. They do it all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they give multiple choice to the market and say, which one do you like? <laughs> Um, but yeah, but then well, how come the markets are always not on the same page as the Fed, right? I mean, the Fed issues a forecast, and you look at the Fed futures market, and it's, well, there's always a big divergence. If, if you think about it, though, the Fed, the, the market has been on the Fed side a lot since the start of the year. I remember at the start of the year, me saying, well, the Fed's really not going to raise rates that much. And I was like, no, they're going to raise so much. Well, didn't happen. So the market ends up marking to market, and the Fed marks to market as well, mm -hmm. so that it always seems like they're a little bit apart. But the reality is, the, and the Fed may have said we're going to raise rates five times at the start of the year. Maybe the market said they'll raise them four. And now they say, you know, we will, we'll raise them one more time. The market's saying no, but you're still only one rate away right. from what the, the market hasn't really been that divergent from the Fed. We're pricing in a hike in March time. right now. Yeah, that's that, when the that hike probably makes a little sense. And June as well. Um, right. So you think they'll also trigger the balance sheet start? Oh, I think they in have to. Yeah, they, they have to go somewhere with this. This is necessary just to, just to show progress. Mm -hmm. uh, as for the Fed, you know I'm, I'm critical of the Fed. I, it's my, beating up on them is pretty much my favorite sport. When's the last, do you remember me writing about the Fed lately? I haven't written on about them in a long time. And I look for an excuse to write on them. So they're playing ball these days. They're not, they're not going anywhere they shouldn't do. As long as they do start on balance sheet management and don't raise rates at the next meeting and probably for the rest of the year, then I can't knock them. David? I, I think that I think there's, there's some... Uh, balance sheet management is a very, very interesting topic because we can all talk about rates and whether they raise them or lose them, lower them, whatever. But they're they're going in such small increments; it's amazing. Now we we used to raise rates, you know, two percentage points at a time. Now we're now we're talking about a quarter of a percentage point is a raise. I mean, it's like it's it's almost meaningless. But if they start doing this balance sheet management, I, I believe that's where, um, and I think that they might start to attempt that uh, as they attempt balance sheet management. If, it, if there is some sort of hiccup in the economy, whether the economy is, is that causes it or not, if there's just some sort of hiccup in the economy come the fall, which, which tends to happen, then they will, I think there will be a general panic at, at, at that because they don't want to see anything happen. And it, to your earlier point, you know, other central banks have come in and bought equities. They bought U.S. equities, you know, for the past three or four years, five years. So our central bank will do the same thing, and, and they'll come in and they'll support markets. If they support markets at that point, that's when I think you're going to see um, – that's almost a panic move on their part, and that's where you start to say, wait a minute, what really is, the emperor has no clothes. What's really behind this market? What's really supporting it? What, why are these valuations what they are? And if you look back in, I mean, just go back in, in recent history. In 2000, we had a tech bubble. In 2008, we had a housing bubble. Both those times, what, were we, what, were, what, was, the, what was the actual bubble? It was paper. We were, we were selling paper at, at valuations that were too high. Okay, you know, what are we doing now? We're selling paper that's at valuations that right now are justified, as Sarge says. They're justified because, and why are they justified? Because that's the price on the screen. But at some point in time, if they're not, that can cause, you know, that can cause a big problem. And I think that's when the Fed, 
uh, we'll see what the, what they're really made of when that happens again. And it's going it, it, it's inevitable. It happens. History, history tells you it happens. But guys, you, you guys don't seem that worried about the balance sheet unwinding process. I think balance sheet unwinding will be happening over here while you have tax cuts happening over here. So everyone's excited about really, tax though? cuts, but I mean, they're really hear anxious about, about tax cuts all balance the time. sheet. Yeah, and nothing happens. You hear right. about balance sheet unwind, and nothing, and nothing happens. happens. Right. That's and true. So but it, relatively soon. People say, people say, look, the tax cuts, they're going to be great for equities. And people say the balance sheet unwind, that could be really bad for the economy. So you put the two together, and you've got a nice smooth sale. And so I think the Fed's going to wait to see what's happening there in, in, in Congress land. Congress passes it, then maybe they can be a little bit more aggressive when it comes down to the balance sheet unwind. And we also have to put this in the context. Let's say the Fed decides to reduce the size of its balance sheet by $150 billion next year. Ooh, that sounds like a big number. They issue about $1.5 trillion worth of Treasury bonds in a year. Mm -hmm. So it's about 10% of the Treasury issuance, right? You've got about well over a trillion dollars of investment grade probably coming. It's a drop in the bucket. I think it would push yields a little bit higher but it's not going to be noticeable to anyone other than the people who trade this for a living, right? It who might push today and buys, from buys that excess? You know, pension funds will. There, there's money there to buy Chinese, it. Chinese, the Japanese, right? the IRA. And the, oh, right. yeah, and the IRA. And you also, right, <laughs> and bond markets are just continuously, right? There's always coupon money coming in. There's new pension fund money coming in. I, I think it'll get absorbed. I think it might have, you know, if they did 150 billion, maybe it's five to 10 bips on the 10 year max is the exposure. So whatever, 218 versus 228, it's not gonna be a big deal. The Fed is gonna be very, very careful to make sure that they cap the size of the balance sheet on wine. I think it's gonna be somewhere probably between 100 billion and 200 billion, probably at the lower end of that. It's gonna be very digestible for the bond market. It's a drop in the bucket to the grand scheme of the bond market. That's the key. If they can manage it like that, it might have a slight impact, but not big impact. And if anything, financials would benefit if we can see a little bit steeper yield curve. You can always stop doing it if you have to. Exactly. And the but, president's going to reappoint Janet Yellen. Well, actually, that's what I wanted to talk about, because we talk about this Fed put in the markets, this Janet Yellen put. But the Federal Reserve right now could be a much different Fed in a year from now. So how do we really digest any of the signals we're getting from the Fed when you have three governor vacancies, and now you have Stanley Fisher resigning, that's four, and you think Janet Yellen's going to be reappointed, but there is uncertainty about her future well, because Trump has given us mixed sing signals. The president has signaled he's a low dollar, a cheap dollar guy. He's a low interest rate guy. Janet Yellen is thought of as a dove. They don't seem to be openly combative. I think he's going to offer the position. I think he's going to try to hire three people just like her. And I you don't guys agree? It, I don't think it matters who you put in charge of the Fed. I think it's one of those jobs that once you're at the Fed, once you're at the, you have the right to pull the trigger or do this, you are going to become dovish. The nature of the job makes you dovish. It's like you could hate Tom Brady. They put you as coach of the, you know, of the Patriots. You're probably going to use them. So I think anyone who takes that job is so scared of blowing up the economy that they naturally are going to become dovish. You mean the governor job or the president? The chair. No, the chair. The chair okay. is really the only one that matters, I think. And ultimately, you take that job, you look at raising rates, you look at being aggressive or hawkish, no matter what you might think, I think you're going to be too scared to do it. So it doesn't really matter who comes. We're going to see more of the same put, Fed put. If Janet Yellen is going to be reappointed, then wh I mean, why did Stanley Fisher resign? Some are saying that that was sort of a sign that maybe Janet Yellen's future is more uncertain than we think. Reading anything into that, guys? I, I love to read stuff into that. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, do tell. Who, who, knows, who knows why Stanley <laughs> Fisher resigned? I mean, you, you can't really, you, you don't know. But the fact is, he did resign. And, and he was, a, he was a, a supporter of, of the system and the status quo. So, so if he resigns, it'd be like a Supreme Court judge, you know, one of the liberal side of the thing resigning. There's a certain point you're like, wait a minute, what's happening here? Why is he resigning? So... I kind of disagree. I, I agree with, with you, Peter, that, that when you get into those jobs, you, you tend to say, okay, I don't want something bad to happen on my watch. So you go mm -hmm. along with what's been happening because it's been working. At some point in time, I mean, I'm old enough to remember Jimmy Carter and what was happening then. And Paul Volcker was not a go-along guy. He changed, he blew everything up and changed it all. And he was successful. But at some point in time, if, if there is a crisis in the economy, they'll blow the whole thing up. And I think that that... I, I just think that we are that that because of the, the the nature of the economy now and the way it's grown in the last eight years, versus the money that's been pushed into it, I think we're getting very close to the point where where something significant is going to happen. It has to, you know, it's it's a it's a breaking. Um, yeah, point. And, and whether you're a dove or a hawk as the Fed chair, I mean, we've seen the Federal Reserve many times make incredible mistakes that have caused recessions. 
Obviously, the best example is right before the 2008 collapse, right? I mean, Janet Yellen, all these people running the Fed, Ben Bernanke, I mean, they didn't think there was anything wrong with the housing market. I think that's their problem. They are serial bubble blowers. And the only thing I think that is different this time around is that they will act faster. They will act more aggressively. Do to they have money the tools the to act faster? Sure they do. They'll just buy every bond in sight. I think that's the, like, they really seem to have unlimited resources Well, they'll likely be less academic, state. too. So you may have more pragmatic people. Mm. Like a Gary Cohn, perhaps. Hopefully. I think he's probably, probably be excellent. But <laughs> even if it's not him, as long as it's somebody who has real-world business experience, you're going to come at it from a better place. But as an investor, I mean, Peter, perhaps you would disagree with this, but you should be watching who is running the Fed, right? I mean, if you're a retail investor out there, I mean, this has got to be on your Look, radar. The, the, the Fed's still the most important entity that we have in the financial markets, you know, the, 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 the core of it. But at the same time, you're also sitting with a Fed now that's very anxious about the size of their balance sheet mm. because they realize right. we own a lot of stuff and it's priced he all the way all up, up here. here. Right. Mm. And that, that can cause some anxiety because also, and as they raise interest rates, they shoot themselves in the foot because now they've got to pay higher higher uh, interest rates. Right. So For, for the government debt. So right. sort of like, so you know, that you're, you're not really in a win-win situation if you're in this Fed position. You're hoping you can unwind this balance sheet rather quietly. But I think a lot of it goes back to Bernanke's op-ed in the Washington Post way, way back when he started QE. He said, look, we're going to embark on this journey, but it's up to you, Congress, to start pushing some rules out there that's going to take some of the pressure off the Fed. And every single year, the, the, the Congress has said, you know what, it's not our problem, Fed. You just keep on doing what you're doing. And I think it's reached this crux now where the Fed is very concerned. They're trying to push Congress to do something. And I think that you know, the solution could be, well, you know what's going to come through this, this tax cut. Or it could be, look, we'll let you repatriate your money from overseas. We'll give you a tax cut on that. But guess what? You're going to buy U.S. Treasuries with it. And then the Fed can offload their Treasuries onto the corporates. But that way, it's a way for you to kind of get something off the Fed's balance sheet, but still in the U.S. And I think that there's solutions like that that could be negotiated within the tax clause that, that could be a win-win for America. Yeah, let's talk more about tax reform. I mean, how many people here think it's coming this year, done deal? I can't say that. I, I, I would like to see it this year. I think there's still a chance. But I realistically, I think we're talking first half of 2018. Mm. David? I think uh, I, I thought tax reform was going to be done this year and was a layup. And now, just by the, uh, the animosity within, within the government, in fact, I find it amazing that they, they haven't been able to, uh, they haven't accomplished anything. The only thing they accomplished was they raised the debt ceiling, but they only raised it, the only way they did that was off of the backs of Harvey and Irma. So, so you're like, okay, if, if that's all we can do, then how are they going to reach some agreement? I mean, they should be able to reach agreement on tax policy. Uh, you know, it, it, sh they, it should be a win-win for everybody, and whether or not they can do it, I don't know. Well, because right. this undeniably benefits everyone on both sides I, of the aisle. I would say, yeah. They, they, there are ways to benefit both yeah, sides of the aisle. there are many, many Democrats and Republicans, and Republicans who don't want to work with Trump it. no matter what. Well, they got it. Well, they they're, also, they're, well, also, yeah. they're also Democrats and Republicans that, if you go away from the Trump issue, there are also Democrats and Republicans that, that have serious ideological differences with what you know, what bill is going to be passed, who's going to receive the benefits of these, uh, you know, of the tax reforms. And so, you know, the, the wealthy, the, the poor, the corporate, the, you know, the small business. So, so those are the kind of things that have to be hammered out. And my, my thought is we haven't heard much about it. And had they really been able to hammer it out? Are they really, you know, you talk about them behind the scenes doing this, but I'm not sure that they have been. And I, I'm a bit concerned about that as well. And particularly, I think there's going to be some use of the tax reform as a very political weapon. So mm -hmm. if you look, they've been talking about getting rid of the state and local tax deduction. They've been talking about That'll limiting- That for people in New York and New, New right. Jersey. Right. And yeah. the big Democrat <laughs> right. states. In fact, the other things, right? Getting rid of mortgage deduction of homes above 500,000. If you look where the homes above 500,000, oh, there's a place, a lot of blue states. So there is some evidence that they're using tax policy right, right. as a way to punish Democrats. So I don't know how easy it's gonna be work to, for people to work across the aisle. I, I think there's a real chance that this gets bogged down and we get back into the political storm. I'm hoping it's not the case. I hope Trump remains under control. I kind of monitor his tweets very carefully. To me, it looks like he walked in the Monday after Hurricane Harvey and General Kelly was waiting there and said, no, no more of this. Get Someone's going to monitor your phone. We're going to retweet things that are reasonable. You can still be a little bit aggressive, you can still, but we're going to be much more careful who we attack, how we attack, what our language is. So if you watch, there's been a clear change in his messaging since the Hurricane Harvey weekend, which I thought he was just disastrous about. And even when you look at the press conferences, he doesn't take random questions anymore. He's trying to stick to point. 
if this can all work out, it's great. If it reverts back to it all, I think you want to be out of the market for a while because then that's what triggers, I think, the real danger is fall. Dangerous, and right. your comment on General Kelly is spot on. This, this is the most important Marine since Dan Daly. I mean, this guy is key but, to the U.S. government. But investors know that Trump is bombastic on Twitter. I mean, how, how could that tank the markets? I mean, that, that's, if Trump goes back to his old Twitter ways, that's you know, a reason to leave the market? I, I think that what Trump's realized now is that there's some hardline Republicans he's not just, he, he can't bring over to his side. But there's probably some moderate Democrats that he can. All right. And there's some moderate Democrats out there. There's some moderate Republicans. It could be he could get support from both sides of the aisle to actually push things. And he didn't get that much pushback for what he did when he came down to the debt ceiling. I, I agree. So given he didn't get that pushback, given that he looks at the Republican side and they haven't done anything for him, they've mm -hmm. come there and said, we'll get this done. We've been working seven years on a plan. They couldn't get anything done. His view is, and remember, he ran as a Republican, but he never was really a Republican. Right. So his view is, you know what, let me just see if I can reach over the aisle, give them a little something, and, and forget about the hardline Republicans. Let's see how they do when they try to get reelected. But this goes back to my, my point earlier, this debt ceiling issue. I mean, if you think back to before Hurricane Harvey, there was no movement on the debt ceiling issue. Then the storm came, they got it done. So um, unless we have a storm in December, I mean, what's to say we're not going to be back into the same gridlock Did he get on a the promise, December though? 8th deadline? Did he get a promise from Pelosi, from Schumer? Did they promise? Maybe they said, okay, you give us this, we'll give you that. Well, we don't know, but as an investor, you have to plan for another showdown in December. And oh, you have to. Of course you will. And, and there'll be headlines every which way, and we'll have a little bit of a sell-off, and then we'll buy them on a dip, and it'll, it'll go higher again, because that's, that's why we have the debt That's what it does. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we'll have our Santa Claus rally right on time. You guys, though, <laughs> seem not worried about the debt ceiling issue tanking the markets if we do get some sort of showdown in December. I'm not worried about the debt ceiling. I, mean, I am worried about the budget somewhat. I'm not worried about the debt ceiling. I don't worry about much, to be honest with you. You know, I'm kind of an aggressive guy, and I go I don't on. I mean, I'll be all <laughs> like you. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> But David, you worry about a lot. I'm not worried. I, actually, that's that's. It sounds like I'm worried about a lot because I'm I'm you know I. I, I You're giving him a hard. I'm time. conflicted with Stephen, but I'm not worried <laughs> because because I, uh, you know, I'm protected. I own gold. So. Oh, all right. So, so should you were, we talk about gold? You were talking earlier. You said okay, the S and P is up. You know, twelve or thirteen percent, whatever it is eleven or twelve percent this year, and you know everything's up between let's say nine and fifteen percent. Um, gold is up. It was up yesterday, 15 is down a little 16, bit today, 16%. Yeah. So, right. so we're, we're right, we're in the same range. And so that brings us back to a point that Doug made. It's very, very dollar related. And so I think that that, uh, that is going to, that, that uh, relationship is going to remain uh, very, very strong. And so uh, you got to watch it. And I think the dollar is going to become weaker and weaker. Yesterday, Doug and I were talking on the, on the outside. Uh, it was interesting. It, you know, mainstream media doesn't cover this kind of stuff, but it was interesting yesterday in the in the release from uh, North Korea and, and the deal, okay, we're going to put sanctions on North Korea, and China agrees, and Russia agrees, and everybody agrees, fine. And in the fine print, it says, okay, by the way, we, the United States, uh, reserve the right to, if you don't go along with, with these sanctions on North Korea, we will not trade with you. And the way we will do that, the way we will impose it, is through uh, restrictions on, on dollar movement, mm -hmm and through the SWIFT system, which is international um, currency. And so uh, it comes back to the petrodollar, where, where you, you, we've traded oil, for dollar, oil in dollars for the, since 1981 or something, or 1979, whatever it was, in that petrodollar system. Other countries are breaking away from that. So for us to threaten them with, with the idea that they will not be able to trade internationally in dollars, whether it's China, Russia, or any Middle East country, or even Europe, they, they're not going to look on that kindly, and so that's where you get stuff like uh, the Russians and the Chinese have already have you know bilateral agreements. The Chinese and the Indians are working on bilateral agreements. Uh, South America with with uh, Russia, South America with the Chinese. There's all sorts of bilateral agreements yeah. going on away from the United States. And if they move away from, if they continue, I shouldn't say move. If right. they continue to move away from a petrodollar or the dollar in general internationally, that put that is weakness so, on the dollar. This is yeah, a huge ahead. like historical you know significance as well in that. You know, when the UK ran trade, everyone traded in sterling. Thank you. When the Portuguese did, everyone traded in whatever they had in, Portu in Portugal. When the Greeks did, same thing. Romans, same deal. Nowadays, it's not the U.S. that necessarily is running trade. China has a big hook in it, too. Uh, right. And China said, you know what, why should we take dollars from you? Why don't you pay us in Chinese currency? And they're, they're signing agreements all around the world. They're about to come out with a Chinese-denominated uh, um, gold, um, gold, right. gold, gold thing. 
Oil is being denominated in China now as well. And so as the is US, Bitcoin. So, uh, and, and so the U.S. is no longer going to be that currency that's used for international transactions. China's moving into that business too. Well, and it's no now, longer why wouldn't they? Be... Because if China's doing business with Russia, why, why should they, they have to the go dollars? through the dollar right. and have the U.S. say to them, you know what, no, 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 go with us or else we won't let you settle that trade. And right. the dollar is also losing its safe haven status. Doug, this is well, something you've talked about quite a bit. Any time we've seen a sell-off, you see the euro rise, the yen rise, not the dollar. Can you explain that dynamic and do you expect it to continue? Well, I think that for international companies to turn around and say, well, let's buy dollars because something rough's going on in the world and then be told by the U.S. Treasury system that we won't let you settle those dollars because of this, that's a problem. That's a problem. Now, you have some countries that own a lot of U.S. Treasuries, be it Saudi Arabia or China. And so the U.S. is sort of limited to how much they can really push these countries towards doing things because guess what? They're the guys we owe the money to. Right. And you can't push them too much. If you turn around to Saudi Arabia and say, you know what, we're not into what you're doing here, then they'll turn around and say, well, we're going to sell all of our treasuries. How do you, how do you feel about that? So China can do the same thing. But we've, we've backed ourselves into a wall here where negotiation-wise, it used to be we, we didn't worry about people with oil. You know, if someone was giving us oil and we were getting oil from that country, we worried about them making sure they were happy. Mm. Nowadays, we're not getting the oil from them anymore. We've got fracking. Instead, we rely on them to buy our U.S. treasuries. And so we have to right. be very, very careful diplomatically not to upset the guys that own our treasuries, and that's China and Saudi Arabia. Well, I, you can't really <laughs> hold your breath for that, right? China I mean, also needs us to buy their stuff. That's right. right. It's, that's a symbiotic relationship. Mm. That is a good point. And that's whole, that's tr that was Trump's whole campaign, that's right. essentially. And in the meantime, buy Lockheed, Raytheon, General Dynamics, and Boeing. So <laughs> that, that's, all, that's all well and good. But, but in that symbiotic relationship, when you have struggles and when you have conflict, okay, fine, where do you now go? It, it has been... In, in the last 20 years, everyone went to, like you were saying, treasuries in the U.S. dollar. If they're not going there now, where are they going? Are you going to the Chinese RMB? No, you're not, because it, that's not nearly as big as the dollar. Are you going to the Russian ruble? No, no there's no way. So where do you go? You go to gold. So th there's, I think there is a, there's a, an ascension there of monetary, it's, a mon it's, it's money. And you have to find stable money, and gold is stable money. But aren't, so, aren't investors wary of the dollar due to reasons we talked about earlier? Because they're worried about Trump, his Twitter account. Yeah, I, I, but they're worried about the, his the, policies. The, 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 con the concept happened. that the dollar is weakening because people are worried about Trump is just so incorrect that, 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 that it's shocking to me. Trump came in on day one, when he was, even when he was running, he said, I want a weaker dollar. I, I want agree. the U.S. to be more competitive. The dollar is weakening on the back of that. When the Treasury Secretary is asked, do you want a weaker dollar? He said, look, a weak dollar is not bad in the short term. In the long run, though, strong dollars in U.S. interest. When, the tra when trade representatives have been asked, they've said, look, other currencies are very weak versus the dollar. Right. So it's, it's an administration push here to have a weaker dollar. It's not because of his policies and he, he's terrible in office. This is, this is his policy. His and policy is and, and trading oh, the financial the markets would complain about a weak dollar. That but, makes no sense to me. But every it other actually makes it world. easier for yeah, us to make a, money. Yeah, but a lot of big U.S. companies have a lot of exposure to overseas, right? Something like half of the S&P 500 revenues come from right. abroad. And, and, so, and, and so as that, we said, so when the dollar, weakens, if the weak, if the when the dollar weak. weakens by 1%, S&P earnings go up half a percent. Right. It's fantastic That's for the S&P for a weaker dollar. That's why the top half of the S&P 500 is outperforming the lower half by so much. But if so you're much. in one of these companies that has a lot of well, exposure to Europe, that's Well, then sell it and buy something else. Well, I guess right. that's one option. So, <laughs> well, let's go, let's go one step further. It says, okay, the, the dollar, we are, we are I, and I agree in agreement with Doug that they're actively pursuing a weaker dollar policy, and e whether, it's, whether it's, it's consciously or unconsciously, it's happening through these different credit agreements, through diplomatic, diplomatic agreements, whatever, fine. But we've also created a huge amount of dollars, trillions worth, since, since 2008. Those dollars have found a home in, in banks and every, you know, all, all globally. If that dollar becomes weaker and weaker, those dollars are going to, they're, they're going to come home. They're not, going to, they're not going to stay where they're at because why do you want a, a depreciating asset? You don't want it anymore. So as, as that process continues, it could feed on itself. And once again, you're saying, okay, when does that process, when do they lose control of that process if they ever do? I'm not saying they will, but I think that they could. And that's where you certainly want to buy, have something and, like and that precious metals or gold. That would cause what? Inflation, right? It would cause it, yes. And it would get everybody out of debt. Fine. Yes. So, okay. Good. <laughs> so, no, no, no. so what do you want to own? Do you want to own dollars or do you want to own gold at that point? The, the if, other, you, if you are not oh, in you're debt, for gold if you're not in oh, yeah. debt, you don't want dollars. The, the, the other, like, 
narrative that was going out there was that Draghi's very concerned about the strength of the euro. He didn't mention the strength of the euro. He, he didn't mention the volatility. Yeah. He's worried about the pace of dollar weakness, yes. not the direction. Not the direction. Uh, when you I look agree at Canada, who's also had a tremendous rise versus the dollar, the Canadians said, you know what, we can handle this. And they just raised rates. Yeah. When you look at Japan, who are normally very jawboning about they want a weaker yen, silence. Doug, when you, you mentioned, look at you Merkel, who's yeah. running for election, she doesn't mention the strength of the euro for, for Germany. It's not noticed. Well, they don't want to shock the markets. Doug, you mentioned the euro. You have a pretty bullish forecast on the euro for the end of the year, dollar thirty, right? Sure. What does that do to European stocks, which have run up quite a bit so far this year? But as we see the euro rise, we've seen the the air come out of the you know European well, stock rally. It, it does two things. I think that not every European stock is an exporter in the United States, or, or is an importer from the United States. A lot of European stocks just deal within Europe. And if I'm in the U.S. and I think that the U.S. dollar can weaken by 15 percent, I may say, well, I'd rather be in a European equity because even if it goes down 15 percent, if the currency goes up 15 percent, I'm unchanged. Mm. So European equities are much more attractive to me than U.S. equities at this time if I'm an international investor. Mm. Peter, do you agree? Yeah, I think that's one of the things we, we have to be better at focusing on. I think we talked about this last time. If you're looking at European stocks, you really have to look at the total value converted to dollars today. And you look at some of the indices, oh, it hasn't done as well, but okay, the euro's up 10%, that, so the, they've actually outperformed. And I think this mindset where we kind of just look at oh, what the percentage change is and not take into account the FX, it's wrong and leads to mistaken you know, positioning. So I think you want to own European stocks, or if you do, you certainly want to own them in euro right now, rather than buying one of the funds that hedges out the euro risk. Right. Guys? I agree totally. I, I, and, and the other side is uh, when it comes to European stocks, I'm not, I am nowhere near an expert in European stocks, but I will say they, they have, it's somewhere in the area of, I think, 30 to 40 percent of their trade is with China or the Far East. So, so the, sure, we're a huge trading partner of theirs and we matter. Yeah, the U.S. But is only a 20 percent of their trade. There. So it's even less. So, so my point is, you know, on a dollar basis, I, I Go euro, right. stay euro quickly. And, yeah, and I think know. euro stocks, you always have to remember, are very, very heavily concentrated in banks. The European indices are much more bank heavy than ours, so I think you're there already you buying the European banks, but if you think that's where the growth is likely to come, and I think that's a likely place, right? If European business is growing around, ban European banks should do well. They've had all the support from Draghi. They had plenty of years to repair their balance sheet. I like European banks, and that will really drive European stock indices because they're a much bigger weighting than over here. And it's tough for the home gamers to pick individual stocks from other yes. countries. That, that's why I suggested the, the financial ETF earlier in the day. It's easier than, than valuing Barclays right. or Credit Suisse or... All the uh, other European banks We have out three there. minutes left, and I want to end by quickly talking about black swan events. Obviously, you can't predict those, but help our audience out and just kind of give us, you know, one big reason to worry for the rest of the year. I mean, what could really come in out of nowhere and tank the stock market or really disrupt someone's portfolio in a meaningful way? Sarge? North Korea gaining an ally? <laughs> that would be disastrous for the well, it's certainly possible. for the regional economy. I don't think it's possible. I, I don't think anybody wants to side with North Korea right now. But that would be a black swan event that came out of nowhere. The more predictable failure would be on, in, along the lines of tax reform or the central bank. Mm -hmm. David? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure where a black swan event would come out of. I mean, I mean just because I, I, geopolitically, I, I think it, you are far more uh, likely to get a black swan event almost out of the Middle East where, let's say, uh, Syria is, the, the, that problem is becoming resolved, but it's becoming resolved when the Russians are winning, the Iranians are in there, and, and what if the Israelis don't like it and the Saudis, the Saudis and the Israelis had a secret meeting last week and the Israelis went and bombed a, a, a facility in Syria. If something happens over there to ignite that again, that includes the Russians and the Iranians, the Chinese will come in on it. So there could be something there, but I think the far more I, I think there. I think it's going to be something very subtle, like like a. I think someone's going to go bankrupt, and cool. <laughs> Hartford, Connecticut, just came up and said that they're almost going to go bankrupt. So let's say. So here's a here's an interesting fact. Okay, okay we're running out of time. Though. If Hartford goes bankrupt, Puerto uh, Puerto Rico went bankrupt. Uh, Detroit years ago settled. Uh, some of the California cities are bankrupt. If there's a significant bankruptcy, what if Houston goes bankrupt or Chicago and the Illinois budget doesn't get resolved and they go bankrupt? If there's an event like that that places a huge strain on the federal government or the or federal law on how to mm -hmm. resolve that, that could be a, a huge market uh, uh, dislocation event because the Fed would be involved. Somebody would be involved. Right. Everybody's like, wait a minute, everything's overvalued. This debt is Peter, very quickly, tell about, risk. Yeah, accidents always close, come close to home. Mueller. I think the risk that Mueller does dig huh. up something in the past and that comes back to haunt us and derails everything we've been talking about. That to me I think is the black swan and 
in typical black swan form, it's there, people are thinking about it, it's just off everyone's radar screen right now. I think that's the biggest that's risk. That's a great point. Yeah, and we haven't heard from Mueller. I mean, obviously there have been storms taking right. center stage, but that investigation has been going on for a while. I assume he's turning away, right. grinding through papers. If he finds something that comes out bad, I think that's a risk. Mm. Douglas, any tail risk on your radar? Uh, North Korea, I think we moved to a naval embargo. If there's a naval embargo, given the U.S. fleet is already doing a lot of work, I think that there could be errors that could happen out there between Chinese, Russian, U.S. naval folks. Could, Error, uh, errors are happening already. Cause something that, they that they doesn't work out well. They crash into transports. We've had two ships, two destroyers hit transports. And the third that, one grounded off, right, off so Japan. So, so they're already happening. All right. So there's a lot of strain out there. and. That could lead to some issues. Well, enjoy these record stock levels while they last. That'll do it <laughs> for us. We'll, what? We'll end on that. <laughs> Stephen, David, Peter, Douglas, thank you guys thank you as always guys. for watching. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next month.